Today I want to talk about the idea of representing a natural number in base factorial. But before we even talk about what that means, let's recall what it means to represent natural numbers in base b. Okay, so well, it can be really summed up in the following fact. So if we've got a natural number b, which is bigger than or equal to 2, every natural number has a unique expansion with respect to this base. And that expansion can be written as follows. So we've got a natural number n, and it's a0 plus a1 times b to the first power, plus a2 times b squared, all the way up to ak times b to the k, where that k is clearly going to depend on the size of n. And the important things is that the coefficients of the powers of b are all between 0 and b minus 1. So just as some really basic examples, 21 can be written as 2 to the 4th plus 2 squared plus 2 to the 0. 2 to the 0 is obviously 1. Or sometimes it's written like this. So the place value of this digit is 2 to the 4th, in other words, 16. The place value of the digit just to the right is 2 cubed or 8. And notice that doesn't appear in the sum over here. So we would read this as maybe 1010 zero, zero base 2. Or the number 194 can be written as 5 cubed plus 2 times 5 squared plus 3 times 5 to the first plus 4. And in base 5, that would be the number 1, 2, 3, 4. So I think that's kind of cute. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, base 5. And now, previously on the channel, we talked about so-called base Fibonacci expansion of numbers, and that's called Zeekendorf's theorem. And let's just recall what that is real quick, although check out the video after you're done watching this one if you're psyched. So it says that every natural number can be uniquely represented by a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So if you don't add this rule that you have non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers, then you do not get a unique representation. You can play around this with this if you'd like to. So let's notice that 70 can be written as the 10th Fibonacci number plus the 7th Fibonacci number plus the 3rd Fibonacci number. And just as a heads up, 55 plus 13 plus 2. Okay. So now that we've kind of recalled all of this kind of background information, let's talk about our real idea here, which is base factorial. Okay, so let's start by dipping our toes into this factorial number system by looking at the number 2110 base factorial, and that's the notation we'll use. So the place value here is the multiple of, well, whatever factorial you're at. So this furthest right digit is a multiple of zero factorial. This next, next digit will be a multiple of one factorial and then two factorial and then three factorial. So this number expands out to two times three factorial plus one times two factorial plus one times one factorial plus zero times zero factorial. And adding all that up, you get the number 15. And so to put it like into a bigger package, you would say that the number ak, ak minus 1 down to a1, a0 factorial is the sum as i goes from 0 to k of ai times i factorial. And then there's got to be some sort of rule on the size of the digits. There always was when we were talking about base b and even base Fibonacci. And in, in fact, the rule is this. We need ai to be between 0 and i, and we can include i here. Notice that means that this 0 factorial digit is always 0, and I'm not exactly sure why we keep that one around, as it just always gives us the number 0, but in the references that I was looking at, that's always part of it. Okay, so let's look at all of the 1 to 3 digit numbers in base factorial. So the first one would simply be zero. So I don't think there's much to say there. Then you've got one zero base factorial. So that's gonna be one factorial plus zero times zero factorial. In other words, the number one. And so the number two is one zero zero factorial. And then the number three is one one zero base factorial. That's because that's two factorial 
plus one factorial. And then as you can see, you can easily represent the number four and the number five. And that's all we have. Notice that this number is most definitely the largest as the two factorial place, its coefficient can only be zero, one, or two. And so we're using the largest coefficient there. Same thing for the one factorial place. And that means that the first four digit number, which is one, zero, zero, zero subfactorial is six. And that's actually gonna be an important little fact, or that's an example of an important little fact that we'll use later. And that is that the largest K digit base factorial number is in fact K factorial minus one. That's exactly what we see right here. So notice the largest three digit is three factorial minus one, AKA the number five. And so it's pretty clear what number this is. It's just the number that achieves all of the maximum digits. So we just have to show that that actually sums up to K factorial minus one, and it's not too bad. So let's look at this. We'll have the sum as I goes from zero to K minus one of I times I factorial. So again, that's achieving the maximum digit there. And notice I stop at K minus one because, well, we've got a zeroth digit and so this is like k total digits. Okay, so next up, we're going to take this number i and write it in kind of a fancy way. So I'll take this number i and I'll write it as i plus one minus one. And then we'll distribute this i factorial over it. So that'll leave us with the sum as i goes from zero up to k minus one of i plus one factorial. That's what we get from i factorial times i plus one. And then minus the sum as i goes from zero to k minus one of i factorial. That's what we get from distributing the one onto the i factorial. Oh, but check it out. We're essentially done at this point. Notice that we could perhaps re-index this or maybe notice that the only thing that survives after taking the difference here and doing kind of the obvious telescoping action would be the top term of this and the bottom term of this. Now we could get real fancy and re-index this, but I don't think we really need to do that. So the top term of this first sum, well, that's K minus one plus one factorial, AKA K factorial. The bottom term of this second sum is zero factorial, AKA one. So there we have it. We've just done a little bit of an argument about why the largest K digit base factorial number is K factorial minus one. And now we're gonna move on to our main result. So our main result is that every natural number has a unique base factorial representation, where by base factorial, I mean this kind of stuff that we did over here. So this proof is constructive. And so that being said, I've worked out this little example of how it goes before we jump into the generality. So I've taken the number 593. And the first thing that you do is divide it by one, take the quotient and the remainder. And then this quotient will become the new dividend. So in this case, 593 is still 593. Then you're gonna divide it by two, keep the quotient and save the remainder for later, and then keep going. So you'll take 296 divided by three, quotient remainder. 98 divided by four, quotient remainder. And then 24 divided by five, quotient remainder. And then finally four divided by six, quotient remainder. And, and at some point you'll get a quotient of zero and that's when you know to stop. And so this looks a lot like the Euclidean algorithm, except instead of taking the remainders and turning them into your new quotients, you're doing something a little bit different. You're continually increasing what you're dividing by, by one. And so I think this is a pretty interesting algorithm. Okay. And then you're gonna take the remainders, starting with the last one, and form your factorial representation. So we'll have four, four, two, two, one, zero. Base factorial is your original number. Okay, so now let's jump into the general proof of why this works and why it gives us a unique representation. 
So our general argument will rely on building two sequences. And those sequences will be like the remainders and the quotients that we saw during our example. Okay, so let's take some arbitrary natural number n in and then define the following sequences. So I'll call them like a sub something and b sub something. So we'll have a0, a1 up to ak, and likewise b0, b1 up to bk. And we're gonna define those by the following rules. And so you'll start with a0 equal to zero, and then b0 equal to n. That's like your first digit, which as we talked about before is always zero. And then this n, well, that's the first thing that you're dividing by as we saw in our example. Okay, and then you're just gonna repeatedly do like some division. So let's take b0 and do the division algorithm where we divide by two. So this will be equal to two times b1 plus a1. And here, a1 will be between zero and one, again, by the division algorithm. And now we're gonna continue to play this game. So we'll take this b1 and move it down here. It'll be the new thing that we're dividing into. And then we'll define our b2 to be the quotient after dividing by three. Okay, so let's see, we'll have b1 goes down here then we're dividing by three, getting a quotient that we'll call b2, and then this will be plus a2, and in this case, a2 goes between uh, zero and two. And then that's gonna continue on and on and on and on and on until we have the last two steps. So bk minus two will be equal to k times bk minus one plus ak minus one. And here, a k minus one goes between zero and, and k minus one. Okay, great. And then we'll go one more time. So we'll have this b k minus one, and we're gonna divide it by k plus one, and we'll get a quotient of zero. And then our final remainder, which is a k, which I guess we could see that b k minus one is a k in this case and a k will be between zero and k. And now all we have to do is prove that we have indeed built the representation. But before we do that, I'm gonna take these equations and invert them a little bit. And you know, I know that I'm putting the arrow next to the size of the remainder, but it should be really coming from over here. Okay, so notice that we can write a one is equal to, let's see, b0 minus two times b1. And then we can write a2 similarly. So a2 will be, let's see, b1 minus three b2. Then let's see, a k minus one, which is occurring way down here, will be b k minus two, and then minus k times b k minus one. And then finally, a k will be <coughs> b k minus one. Okay, so that's good. And now let's look at the factor, and now let's look at the base factorial number with those digits that we've just created. So we start here at a k, the next one is a k minus one, all the way down to a two, a one, a zero. And like I said, this is like base factorial. But instead of writing these as like, for instance, a k times k factorial, a k minus one times k minus one factorial, I'll write them using the expression that we've created by inverting these defining equations. So that's gonna start with this over here. So we'll have uh, b k minus one times k factorial. That'll be like our first term. Oh, and then what comes after that? Well, it will be b k minus two minus k times b k minus one times k minus one factorial from this next one. And then that's gonna continue on and on and on. And then let's see, 
down here we'll have b1 minus 3 b2 times 2 factorial and then finally this term right here which is b0 minus 2b1 times 1 factorial. But I think like if you're sharp-eyed, you've probably already seen what is going to happen. Everything is going to collapse. So look at this, bk minus 1 times k factorial will get canceled because here we have bk minus 1 times k times k minus 1 factorial and it's attached to a minus sign. So we can see that this object will be canceled with this, well, after it's been distributed through. And then this kind of thing is gonna like continue on and on and on. So this bk minus two term will cancel with something that is coming afterwards. Then let's see what's happening at the bottom. Here we have minus two b1. Oh, and here we have two b1. So this b1 will cancel with this b1. And likewise, this 3b2 times 2 factorial, which is really 3 factorial times b2, will cancel with something that comes before. So what's the only term left? We'll notice that it's this b0 term. But we started by defining b0 to be n. So this is in fact equal to n. Which means, well, what have we done? Looking at the extreme left and right hand side of this equation that we've built, we have a factorial number system representation of n. So that proves that there is a representation. Now let's finish it off by proving that it's unique. We've got one last thing to do, and that is to prove that we in fact have a uniqueness of representation into this factorial number system. So let's suppose we've got a number n, which is the smallest natural number that has, well, at least two representations in this factorial number system. And here I've written them. And I'm reusing our a sequence and our b sequence. So we've got ak down to a0 subfactorial and bk down to b0 subfactorial. And I guess there's a little argument that you need to prove that these have the same number of digits but I think this thing we started out with, with the size versus the number of digits is good enough to say that these have to have the same number of digits. Okay, so now let's write this out. So this means that we have ak times k factorial plus ak minus one times k minus one factorial added all the way down to the ending point is equal to bk times k factorial plus bk minus one times k minus one factorial plus all the way down. And now let's notice that by the minimality of n, we know that the first digit of each of these is not the same. So in other words, the ak cannot be equal to the bk. And well, why is that? Well, that's because if they were equal, we could just cancel them off. And then we would have a smaller natural number that did not have uniqueness. But we've assumed that we've got the smallest one. So let's, without loss of generality, assume that AK is strictly bigger than BK. But that sets up a problematic equation. And what is that problematic equation? Well, let's write it down. So we'll have ak minus bk uh, times k factorial plus ak minus 1 times k minus 1 factorial all the way down equals bk minus 1 times k minus 1 factorial all the way down. But look, these have different numbers of digits, and that's the problem here. Notice that this left-hand side is most definitely bigger than or equal to k factorial. And we know that's true because AK is bigger than BK, which means their difference is bigger than or equal to one. But then by that claim we proved earlier, we know that this right-hand side is less than or equal to K factorial minus one. But you can't have a number that's simultaneously bigger than or equal to K factorial and less than or equal to k factorial minus one, and that is where we get our contradict contradiction. Contradicting the idea that it was possible to have non-unique representation in this factorial number system. So if you're still around, thanks for sticking around so long, and if you haven't subscribed yet, maybe consider subscribing. It would really help us out, and that's a good place to stop.